Super Bowl week is here, and uh, we're back. Another edition of Kevin's Corner. Kevin Bowen, Chris Presley in studio on this Tuesday morning. Excited for the next couple weeks of uh, of the pod, man. We got Marcus Brady mm-hmm. going to be joining us today. Colts offensive coordinator got the promotion. I guess last week was made official. Mm-hmm. Kind of been rumored for quite a while with Nick Sirianni taking the job in Philly. And then uh, Jacob Eason next week on the pod. So uh, really, really excited about both those guests. And we've kind of had a few more guests than we normally do here. We have. Like, I, like I said last week, this offseason has not been quiet for nope. Colts. That <laughs> no, is for no. sure. No, and uh, we certainly see that with our numbers. <laughs> we, we had a ton of listens last week to the podcast and comments on it. So I appreciate you all. Um, I, I know the article numbers are up on our site as well. So we will keep them coming as is. I know that we've talked uh, <laughs> that I don't want to spend uh, every single podcast on quarterbacks. Mm-hmm. We have to talk Matthew Stafford here right out of the gate, obviously. But we will focus on, you know, really the two biggest needs defensively uh, this offseason. And that's edge rusher and that's cornerback. I think that's an absolute must that we need to talk about. We won't spend a whole lot of time. On the Jim Mersey recap, you know, I'll, I'll sprinkle that in kind of yeah. a- as is throughout the podcast, but um, that's up in an article on 1075thefan.com. So if anyone missed that, uh, that's up on the site as well. So, um, and we got to give our Super Bowl picks. We have to, yep. Got to, uh, got to give that at the end. So, uh, make sure we, uh, we hit on that. And anything else I'm, I'm missing? No, I think if we ever get, uh, our opinions for what kind of, you know, chairs we should have in studio. I'll yeah. take Ursay's. That's a nice oh little throne that, that he's got there. Yeah, I think Bob Kravitz <laughs> re- retweeted me. He's like, I don't think you get that at Ikea. Uh, yeah. yeah, and that doesn't look like a Bowen family furniture chair that was put together <laughs> by Maddie uh, slash Kevin. So, uh, yeah, that was quite the throne for uh, for old Jim. And I think that's the first time we've heard from him in quite a while. Um, he wasn't putting up weights. It was no, no. He was not. Definitely not. You know, grunting or boy, I forgot about that. After that Jacksonville game, he he was fired up. You know, clanging and banging those those, those weights. That was just an awesome video. So mm-hmm. I know, uh, obviously, considering um, some of the health concerns that he's battled, he took COVID very very seriously. So uh, know full well that I don't even know if he made all the road trips this year um, with just all of this craziness. But um, passionate as always, emotional as always. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll we'll sprinkle in some of that stuff as uh, as we move along. When the Stafford news broke this weekend, Kevin, what was your what were your initial thoughts? At first, I, I was a little disappointed because I did want Matthew Stafford to be in the Colts uniform. But then when I saw what the Rams had to give up to get him, I kind of liked that Ballard stuck to his guns and didn't give up that much. Yeah, I, honestly, my first thought was um, that's the final drink of the night for me. Uh, that, that 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 was my first thought. It was what uh, ten o'clock on yep. on, on Saturday. I, I thought about going back to the fridge for one more. I uh, bet Jimmy Cook, our producer here for the Dan Dockett show, uh, I took the Bills. He took the Chiefs because he is a diehard Chiefs fan to say the least. And I lost. And he wanted um, the Saint Elmo Cola. Mm-hmm. Have you had that? I have the whiskey. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, I've had it there before. I um, actually had it the night before my wedding. Um, a great, great drink. And so, uh, yeah, so I decided to buy a four pack f- for myself. <laughs> Here you I go. I was like, might as well. Yeah. Uh, tad pricey, sure. But I was like, you know what? Well, whatever. Splurge a little bit. And it was great. So, yeah, I had a couple of those. And I was like, man, should I go one more? And then all of a sudden, <laughs> I'm like, whoa, here we go. Um, Matthew Stafford of the Rams. Yeah. Uh, my, I guess my first thought non um, Saturday night, 10 o'clock, this is the job that I love. I thought, um, I thought definitely a wow trade package, you know, and I, I would say the involvement of golf more than anything, because mm-hmm. when you trade future picks, you know, if you look at the trade value charts, a future third is like a present second. That's kind of how the trade value chart works. So like two future first and a third. Yeah, a little bit steep, but I don't know that that wasn't as shocking to me considering it really, in the days leading up to Saturday, we had heard a lot of, you know, what, over a third of the league is involved, you know, high demand, potentially multiple first-round picks. You know, I, I think that had been building a little bit, but the golf element I thought was interesting. And then his contract. Is that one of those things where, you know, T.J. Warren gets sent from the Suns to the Pacers mm-hmm. and a second-round pick right. gets sent with them because they want you to take on that contract. Now, it's interesting in the, you know, aftermath of it. It sounds like the Lions 
at least publicly, want to see if there's something there with Jared Goff. And I guess it makes a little bit of sense. He's still pretty young, and you know, Brad Holmes, their, their GM, you know, comes from L.A. I would say what else stood out to me, Chris, was just where the Rams are at philosophically in their roster building versus the Colts and really a lot of other teams. The Rams are the definition, I would say, more so than any other team in the league right now of all in. And they've been that way since Goff you know, got into that second, third part of that rookie rookie deal. Yeah. And you could make the argument that, honestly, the Rams have even been that as a franchise for quite a while. It, you know, yep. they drafted Todd Gurley in round one. I mean, very high in round. I mean, he was a top half of the first round. Mm-hmm. So it's not – this has been a franchise that, under various regimes, that have been – and I would say mainly, I guess, under Les Snead as their general manager, that have really pushed their chips. And obviously the trade for Jalen Ramsey was a clear-cut move there. And I, it's it's very intriguing to me. I don't laugh at it from the Rams' standpoint, as I think some people do. Um, it is a very short window that they view themselves right now. They have arguably the greatest defensive football player mm-hmm. of our lifetime, certainly in the last decade or so. And Aaron Donald, he's, what, 29? Yeah. You make the trade for Ramsey. Goff has been okay. Like, all right, I I, I get it. Now, <laughs> you better be right because it's a three-year window, and then it's not going to look pretty, you know, 2024 and beyond. But if they can get it right, you know, I, 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 I you can't laugh at them too much. Uh, they did make – I mean, they were the what? One of the final four teams in the NFC this year with – you know, Johnny Wolford and Jared Goff right, as, as, right. You know, going back and forth. So I guess I, I didn't rip it too much from that Ram standpoint. Again, from a Colts uh, version of it, we probably had to wait until Monday to get more of this information. Uh, you know, Peter King mentioning that the Colts weren't that interested in involving that second first round pick. Albert Breer kind of countering a little bit, and he mentioned that some players were reported from the Colts. Now, I find that pretty mm-hmm. interesting. Again, the fact that Chris Ballard, to me, is willing to involve players uh, shows you that, again, he loves draft picks, but it also shows you that he's interested in making some sort of move. I mean, he's right. not been a big player-driven trade guy, especially quality players, which it would have took him. Mean, you can't throw in, you know, here's Jake Eldren Camp or here's, yeah. <laughs> you know, whoever. I'm sorry to the Eldren Camp family, but... Um, you know, Bobby Okariki, I think that's a name that we mm-hmm. maybe talked about. Like, is linebacker somewhat expendable? Is, you know, do you, would you re sign Walker? Would you draft a linebacker in round four? So that kind of caught my eye a little bit there. And, and I would say, just in general, as I sat there and thought about it more and more and really didn't go to bed until probably 1 or 2 a.m. just thinking about it, was just the fact of, we said on last week's podcast, the Colts have interest. What about the bidding war? Mm-hmm. You know, Chris has just never been a big guy in that bidding war. And quarterback is different. A trade is different than free agency. Assigning a value versus just simply a contract is different than, oh, wow, I know what the contract is, but now I'm giving up precious resources when – you don't have as abundant of those resources as you have in prior off seasons. So that I think is what stood out to me the most is the bidding war got too rich and it got really rich. And I also think the Rams had a unique element with golf. Like you don't see sign and trades uh, Colts have re-signed Jacoby. I mean, whether well, lines have even wanted Jacoby like mm-hmm. that element as well. So, um, yeah, man, I guess that's kind of where I stand on the Stafford thing. Ursay's comments last week, you know, the whole veteran vision yes. at quarterback. It's interesting to me, Chris, because Jim said that so often throughout his 50, 55 minutes. But I, and I tr- really tried to drive home this point last Friday when I was hosting for, for JMV, and I'll do it today. Yes, the most frequent theme in that presser from Jim was we feel like it's win now. We feel like we are a Super Bowl team. We're close. Uh, you know, that was kind of, the, the, the again, the most common thing he said. Therefore, you want to bridge the gap as best as possible. Having said that, he also was very, very clear in that, for one, he's won a Super Bowl. His goal now as owner 
is to win multiple Super Bowls within a decade. And if you listen to him, kind of the easiest way, and again, I say easiest in quotes, or the most ideal way to do that, and he said it, is by drafting that guy. Now, again, he did not say that as frequently as he said the veteran vision, you know, everything screams Stafford by so many of those comments based off the other quarterbacks that you see free agency mm-hmm. and trade-wise that are, that are realistic. But I don't want people to lose sight of that either. Of, yes, Jim has, and he can see it with his roster right now, there is that itch to probably want to be pretty win now. But if you literally look in the mirror, and if you're Chris Bowden and say, my owner wants to win two Super Bowls in a decade, if I feel like I have a long enough leash to achieve that, how is what's the best way to go about that? You know, how, how do I make that happen? Right. To me, I don't even know if that's Stafford. Could you have won a Super Bowl with Stafford? I think it's a possibility. Yeah. Now, he's 32, turning 33 here in a couple of weeks. Like, it's no guarantee that maybe because I'm I, I I'm a big believer in the um it's quantity of darts at the board to try and really win a Super Bowl. I mean, just look at the Peyton era. It's yeah. You would have never thought that that era was only going to be one Super Bowl, but, you know, the 2007 team and the 2005 team and the 2009 team, you know, only one of those three, and those were the three best teams of the era, got to a Super Bowl. And, you know, it was the 06 team that ends up winning it. So I just think it's like, okay, how do you get as many shots possible? Throw the dart. Keep on throwing it. Keep on throwing it. Keep on throwing it. And to me, again, that goes back to what I've said all along, and that's drafting a quarterback. So right. I, I just don't want us to lose sight of that. Yes, Ursa again, most frequently it was veteran vision, win now. You know, we're so close. And I'm, you know, I'm thinking to myself, boy, our season ticket members uh, getting their ticket packages renewed for 2021. Is that due here soon? Like you're a Super Bowl contender, according to you, but then you just said you have got five, five needs at the most important position on the team. I'm like, okay, this isn't really a- adding up to me. So. <laughs> Um, but again, part of that is, is, is Jim. So, um, I, I wanted to make sure that we looked at the Stafford thing and realized, yes, from a veteran vision, that was obvious. Colts had interest. They didn't have as unique of a trade package they could offer as the Rams. And now you really re- reset things. And I guess we'll, we'll wait till Twitter questions to, uh, to get to that. It's not a question that I... Needed a throw to Marcus Brady. Uh, but I did ask Marcus kind of his quarterback trait question, and I think that's an interesting answer that he gives, and that's something that we need to keep in mind. So, right. you know, we'll we'll um, we'll listen to that here in a bit. But, um, yeah, that was kind of kind of the big stuff, Stafford, mm-hmm. per se, related. A- anything from you on, on, on Stafford that I missed, or I guess now that I've kind of gone down the Ursa path a little bit here? No, I thought you you nailed everything. Um, we're it, obviously not a political show, but if Stafford's wife didn't like Detroit, ooh, is L.A. going to be difficult for her? I've started following <laughs> her on Instagram. She's um she's she's an aggressive follow. Yeah, yeah. Um, good for Kelly, I believe is her name. So good for Kelly Stafford and that. Yeah, L.A. is d- definitely different than uh, old Detroit. I um, any other names that you could think of? You know, pick wise or player wise, I should say, going back to the Albert Breer thing. Like, does Paris Campbell have value? That was the other name. That I right. I, I know a lot of people talked about him. To me, I still want Paris Campbell. I still want to see what he can prove in a Colts uniform. I mean, we saw flashes. Agreed. Agreed. I mean, if he doesn't get hurt in that Jacksonville game, who knows how this offense looked. I feel like Phillip Rivers having him and obviously Marlon Mack goes without saying. This team might still be playing. You just never know. Yeah. I, um, I am, you know, relatively bullish on Campbell. Now, obviously, the health has to check out, but... If he can stay healthy, I really think of Michael Pittman, Paris Campbell pairing, you know, for the next handful of years, yeah. maybe even past that, is a pretty good starting point for a young QB. <laughs> now, again, finding that 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 young QB remains the mystery. But uh, no more quarterback talk for 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah, so obviously, <laughs> as you mentioned at the start of the show, we, we want to touch on a quarterback. Obviously, we have to talk about Stafford, but... Really, it's the defensive side of the ball now that we're going to shift our focus to. First one being edge rushers. That's obviously a need. And, you know, these are two needs that Jim Irsay yeah. also mentioned. And, Jim, I thought, mentioned a need that we'll talk about more in the February podcast, but receiver tight end. Mm-hmm. You know, he threw it in there, which I think that's intriguing that, again, we can get to at a later date. But let's um let's focus on edge rusher, Chris. The biggest disappointment 
uh, for this 2020 football season. Individually, sure, you could throw some names in there, but as a group, edge rusher. Why? You stopped the run better than any other team in the league besides one, and you had a all-pro at defensive tackle commanding Mm -hmm. heavy attention, and that dude played so many downs for you. It's not like he was off the field 50% of the time. No, no, no. DeForest Buckner played a ton. And yet, you just you can't win a bunch of single teams. And you didn't win them at a high enough rate. And I just thought the edge presence was really, really lacking. We've talked about the the Justin Houston number um, of quarterback hits, which really stands out to me, Chris. I believe he finished the year, I think it's 12 quarterback hits that he had this season. A guy that I like in free agency, just to throw another number at you, Carl Lawson mm-hmm. from the Bengals had 32 quarterback hits uh 20 you know that's yeah. 20 QB right. hits I mean that boy that's a big difference and I mean not to get nitpicky but you think like okay the Bengals probably were playing from behind more which means their teams weren't throwing as much late in games the Colts had more leads so those teams were probably like there were more opportunities for Houston you know to to get after the quarterback late in those obvious pass rushing situations so um yeah, but you could counter that he was also playing Lamar and Baker, two guys that obviously we saw that our edge couldn't contain. Yeah, and, and again, you know, from a mobile quarterback standpoint, the Colts played the AFC North as well, so there was some overlap in just the amount of quarterbacks that you saw. Lawson was very impressive in the Monday night game against Pittsburgh late in the year um, when Pittsburgh was, of course, falling apart there. So um, I look at Edge Rush right now. Houston is a free agent. al Qadim Muhammad is a free agent. Chris, this might sound a little crazy to people. And I posted kind of a ranking of tiers for free agents up on the site, if you guys want to check that out. To me, the most likely cult to come back in free agency is al Qadim Muhammad. And again, I know a lot of people would just be like, oh boy, okay, wow. And that article will get like the 13th most clicks on the site (laughs) whenever it, it does happen, but... I just think from an age standpoint, from what you kind of need, a three-down guy, great effort, relatively young, I think he's back. So, um, okay, he's back, all right? Kamoko Ture, Ben Banagoo. It's a contract year for Ture. Banagoo's now in year three of a four-year rookie deal. And I know Chris says at times it takes pass rushers time to develop, but, man, it's like, okay, Ture, Banagoo, are you Jerry Hughes? Are you Bjorn Werner? Mm Mm-hmm. And the quicker you can make that decision as a franchise, the better it helps you out. Um, I totally get I, I'm not advocating for cutting either of the two guys, Ture or Banigou. Um, But the time is bleeping now like for them to show up. So when I look at edge rusher, Carl Lawson, Romeo Cora, the Detroit Lion, Notre Dame product, new defensive system up there. We'll see how that plays out. Those two are very attractive to me, Chris, of kind of mid-20-year-olds. You know, there is going to be no perfect answer at edge rusher in free agency. Never is. And the price tag is going to be a lot bigger than what their, you know, past production has shown to me. But um, it's an interesting list. You know, it's Matthew Judon. It's Melvin Ingram. It's Bud Dupree, Leonard Floyd. I mean, there's a lot of... Interesting names. Ryan Kerrigan, I know, is a name a lot of people have thrown around here locally. Colts have had interest in him before. A little bit on the older side, of course. But um, I probably would not bring back Houston. But if I'm doing that, I also need to realize that Banigou and Ture cannot help me out. Or at least I can't trust them to help me out right now on rundowns. Let alone maybe pass downs. But certainly not on rundowns. So I need to go find someone that's not named al Qadim Muhammad to help out this this edge group. So um, I would um, I would spend on free agency. I know drafting one, I, I wouldn't rule it out either, but I think it's kind of a free agency move. Yeah, no, I like that. And it's it's always nice when you get a, a free agent name in here because we don't, we don't typically get a lot of those, but one that we did get this last offseason is another topic that you want to touch about is the cornerbacks. And Xavier Rhodes... He had a pretty cheap price tag this year, but that's going to go up. Dude, it's going to go way up. Um, You know, I've written that he's the most important free agent in 2021, but I also have made the caveat, Chris, of there were three reasons why Xavier Rhodes and the Colts made sense last season. One, he's affordable. I want to say the deal he signed in Minnesota was, I think, like paid him $12 or $14 Mm -hmm. per year. 
I think he made three here last year. Right. Maybe four. I mean, yeah. it's a gargantuan pay cut there. The most important reason why Xavier Rhodes wanted to come to Indy was because of Jonathan Gannon. So, number two reason is the familiar face. That familiar face is now gone. Mm-hmm. Jonathan Gannon, of course, the defensive coordinator in Philly. And then lastly, there was a le- level of hunger. Like any free agent on a prove-it deal. Like Eric Ebron on that first you know, prove-it deal with, with the Colts. There is a level of, I got to I gotta go, man. Like, this team that drafted me and gave me a big second contract, they're done with me. And I'm only 29. Can I prove it? Can I show the rest of the league and the Vikings? And he played the NFC North last year. That probably helped him out a right. little bit as well. Played the Vikings early in the season. You know, played, uh, played the Bears early in the season as well. Those three elements, affordable, familiar face, and hunger, I mean, I hate to say that he won't have the same amount of hunger, but I, I think it's an honest conversation to at least have, yeah. and you certainly have to have it internally if you're the Colts. Are any of those three things going to be here in 2021? Right. Gannon isn't. Affordability isn't. I can assure you of that. Um, you know, people have thrown out, would you tag him? That's interesting. Uh, that's interesting, yeah. Um, that's something I think to keep in mind. But, again, this is a 30-year-old corner. And while I, I consider him important, I also can acknowledge there are some real factors that would make the Colts maybe hesitant to get into that bidding war with him. Because, you know, I don't know Xavier Rhodes super well, but he could strike me as the guy that says, oh, yeah, two, three-year deal, find me the, the, the juiciest one. Right. And, you know, Jacksonville or Seattle or Phoenix, wherever. You know, I'll, I'll go I'll go anywhere. Um <laughs> So we'll see how that plays out. You know, outside corner, Chris, is a need to me because I look at the schedule and I see, oh, DK Metcalf, oh, DeAndre Hopkins, oh, A.J. Brown in your division, um, Stephon Dix. <laughs> you know, right. I mean, it's a pretty good wide-out schedule next mm-hmm. year for the Colts. So I think outside corner is important, and I want to see this defense evolve to the point where you have a corner that can go shadow some guys. You don't need to use it week in and week out, but I want that in my back pocket. I don't think the Colts value outside corner like that, though. I just don't. You hear the hot spots of the defense. You hear the three most important positions for the defense. You'd never really hear outside corner. You hear nickel, slot, corner. Mm-hmm. You hear the will linebacker. And you hear the three technique defensive tackle, which, again, they've got all those three spots very, very well figured out. So I, I no fault there by any means. But, again, I just think outside corner means something. I like Marvell Tell. He's intriguing, but the dude didn't play football last year. Correct. Yeah. And he was making a position switch from from, from college. Rock you seen. I'm not like uh, you know, I can make every toast joke in America. I'm not like all in, this is this dude is done, done by any means. But if you don't have concerns over what you saw from him in year two, then you're just naive. So I think that um it's something that you gotta go out and if it's not Rhodes. You probably have to make a move. And to me, it's not a great corner group. I think it's a little older corner group. Yeah. William Jackson, I know, is kind of a hot name from Cincinnati. But you, know, you haven't drafted corners very well early either. So that, you know, it, it is a bit concerning. But, um, you know, if Xavier Rhodes walks, Chris, okay, you line up and play tomorrow. Your starters are Kenny Moore and, uh, I guess, Rock in the base defense. you got to re-sign T.J. Carey. Yeah. So then it's TJ Carey or Marvell Tell, Isaiah Rogers. I'm 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 you know, kinda got my eyebrows raised a little bit. Okay, that that's a name you want to watch. But again, I just want a little bit more insurance. Mm-hmm. Uh but do the Colts value outside corner in a zone scheme as much as some heavy man schemes. That's where you get in the value on players yep. and things like that. So um the Rhodes one will be interesting to see how that how that plays out. And I guess it comes back to how important is it in this defense. I tend to think edge rusher means more because if I can, if I feel good about my rush, I, I don't have as much pressure on my corners. But um, those are two big needs that I think we uh, we have to think about. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, we are lucky to have. Oh yeah, Marcus Brady. Yeah, uh, interview new Colt, on the show. New Colts OC. Uh, what you'll know about Marcus is this: he's confident, mm-hmm. very confident, um, Frank Wright type confidence, like. Not outwardly pound my chest, but I asked him early on because I heard he can hoop. So I asked him about b-ball skills, and boy, he didn't uh, 
He didn't hide there. So, uh, yeah, this is an interview with Marcus Brady that I did uh, last Friday on the ride with JMV. Let's head to the Andy Moore Automotive Group hotline. He's been a busy man, as you would expect, on this Friday afternoon. He is Marcus Brady, the new offensive coordinator of the Colts. Good afternoon, Marcus. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Congrats on the promotion first. Um, yeah. If I would have told Marcus Brady three years ago that you'd be an offensive coordinator in the NFL, what, what, would you have been surprised, or is this kind of, hey, this is the type of – trajectory i feel like i'm on yeah i would say that i mean that's what my plan was i mean when i got here i set goals and you know just continue to work hard and then wait for the opportunity to present itself i was told to ask you about your uh basketball skills um someone has told me here that you are a hooper um uh, how would you rate your basketball skills uh depends i'm a shooter i'll tell you that uh i mean i am a good, good player competitor i play when I get a chance to, but I know I can shoot, and I can shoot with the best of them. So I love it. You got an NBA yeah. comp for yourself? No, I wouldn't put myself there. Uh, but uh, at least among among the, the players and coaches in the Colts building, <laughs> I, I can compete with the best of them. Is the goal still in there? I know COVID-wise, maybe not. But it, it, have you have you had some uh, maybe friendly wagers with some players and coaches? No, uh, we haven't. Not not recently, but the co- the goal is still in here, uh, but haven't got any shots up here lately. Marcus Brady, uh, new offense coordinator for the Colts, joined us here on the ride with JMV. For fans that might not know, you um you primarily played in the CFL, but I think we're with the Packers and was it oh one oh two something around then. Uh, what do you remember 02. about that uh, about that training camp? Yeah, so oh two season, uh, I was a undrafted free agent and then signed there. Got there for like the second mini camp. And OTAs, and then did some summer training, and then and training camp there. Uh, well, I mean, it was a it was a great quarterback room. I was able to be in. I was able to you know spend some time with Brett Favre. Uh, Doug Peterson was still he was the backup at the time, so it was a great room to be a part of. Uh, learned a lot um, in my brief stint there, um, and, and I enjoyed my time there. What um, ultimately attracted you to the CFL, where you you know stayed for a long time, not only as a player but but as a coach. Uh, really, it was just the opportunity to continue playing. You know, I love competing. I love playing football. I love the quarterback position. So the CFL gave me an opportunity to, you know, continue uh, my professional career. So I went up there. Um, and then when I got up there, I enjoyed my time up there. Enjoyed the game. Um, there's great people there. Um, I met some met some good players, coaches, built some good relationships there. Uh, and I, I just love the CFL. It was, it was a great time there. I spent 16 years there. Um, a lot of good memories there. Did you know Frank before taking the job here in 2018? I did. So he came and visited us when I first started coaching in Montreal. Uh, he knows Mark Tressman, Scott Milanovic. Uh, Mark Tressman was the head coach at the time. Scott, who's here now, uh, was the office coordinator. And then I was uh, the receivers coach at the time. And he came up and visited. Uh, so that was my first opportunity to meet him. And then I might have met him a couple other times, uh, maybe down at the Senior Bowl, I believe. I remember listening to you earlier in the in the week. You said that you learned a little bit of kind of West Coast stuff under Mark Mark Trustman. Was the CFL mainly that in terms of an offensive well, system? No. Or? no. So Mark brought the West Coast system uh, when he came in in 2008. I was actually my last year playing. He brought that up. Scott Milanovic was actually the OC. And so essentially what we did is the pass game was the West Coast offense, but then we still had CFL. You know, run game. Scott did a good job of converting the West Coast style of adding that extra player because it's 12 on 12 up there um, and how it could fit within that system. But as far as the progressions of the quarterback, um, just the system of the offense, it was still West Coast based. So I was able to learn that. And actually, that's what Green Bay was at the time when I was there. So I actually was kind of familiar with some of the terminology. Marcus Brady, Colts offensive coordinator, join us here on the ride with JMV. You've been the quarterback's coach for the last few seasons. For fans that might not know, kind of walk us through some of your maybe weekly responsibilities that uh, that, that comes with that role. Well, in season, I mean, the first thing is protection. So I, I start my week off um, seeing how I can protect the quarterback, both in you know in the play action game, drop back game, um, look at all the different blitz packages that you know that that opponent presents, um, break that down. When do they come? You know, what, what's the look, you know, um, what is the tail or the tip that's going to show so we could, you know, direct our protection to that that way and get it picked up. And then, you know, once I get that done, uh, you know, I'm working with Tom Rathman at the time, working with Chris Strasser, and then, you know, we get that finalized and we pre- present it to the team, uh, you know, as well as Philip as well. Um, he's a big part of that as well. And then throughout the week, you know, present it to the, to the players on Wednesday. Um, usually it's just first down pressures that day. Thursday is uh, third down pressures. 
Um, and then Friday is more blitz zero and some other checks that we can get to. Are those individual meetings with Phillip and, and maybe even a Ryan Kelly, or, or is it more, like you said, in front of the uh, in front of the offense? No, that's in front of the – well, the the first two meetings, Wednesday and Thursday, that's in, in front of the quarterbacks, the O-line, the running backs. And then later in the week when I do go over blitz zero and all our checks, that involves now the, the full offense because the receivers need to know what pass checks we're getting to, how we're picking it up, tight ends need to know because we may have to add them into protection. Um, and then, like I said, the receivers, so they're all in there. So I'm up in there presenting um, to all of them. Obviously, this year, um, probably a little bit of a new wrinkle with, with, with having Jacob in the um, in the quarterback room. Uh, what specifically changed for you this year with just, again, all the COVID stuff, no preseason for, for a guy like, like Jacob Eason? What, what changed for you and how you try to get him to develop? You know, not a lot of practice reps, occasional scout team work when when Philip got hurt what was the week to week like for uh, Jacob Eason um it was just more time trying to get fine a little bit more time because I mean obviously it's still a busy schedule and then most importantly you got to get Philip ready um but uh, whenever having extra time was a post practice or in between meetings just to or even before meetings uh Jacob would come in at times and just answer any questions that he had um out on the field you know get some extra throws um usually kind of going through the script because um, obviously he doesn't get the reps of the practice. You know, pick a period, and then can't do the entire practice, so pick a period of that, of that practice and then kind of go through it, let him, you know, talk to his reads, throw that route. You know, he has some receivers out there, spot up and throw. Um, and then sometimes we'd actually actually throw routes with the receivers if they still had enough enough juice after a long practice. Chris talked about pregame. He would kind of run. I, I don't know if it was a normal route tree, but he, he, he would run, run through, through some things on the field before games. Yes, that was actually pretty good. That was some good work there. Uh, so get a good sweat for him, getting a lot of throws, you know, rushing him so he's moving in the pocket, getting those type of throws. Um, so we just had a couple of receivers just spotting up for him. Um, but kind of just, you know, some of the plays that are in the game plan, obviously we don't want to show too much, but the traditional plays that we run every week, um, the play action, just different unique footworks and then different throws for him. Um, but it was it was a nice, it was a good workout for him. he and I actually both I was sweating on that. <laughs> when you evaluated his film coming out, obviously not a ton of college film, maybe compared to some other draftable quarterbacks, but still had a decent amount. What what jumped off at you, good or bad, about what you saw? Well, his arm talent was the big thing that you saw. You know, he's um, good size. You know, physically um, can move around a little bit, um, but the arm talent to be able to push the ball down the field um, that was the biggest thing that. Um, that you see, you know, he has that quarterback build and big arm and, and you, you want to try to hone in some of the other skills. Um, some of the things that, you know, you, we try to work on after watching that film, is, you know, his footwork um, and his accuracy, which to me go hand in hand. And that's kind of what we focused off, focused on during training camp and during the season. How much is a guy like him sooner or later? It's just you got to rip off the red jersey and 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 see what you have. Obviously, again, COVID, the lack of the preseason just absolutely killed that form that this year. But how much is it? You eventually you got to get to that point where live bullets are flying before you really know what you got. No doubt. I mean, and that's what we're waiting for. Obviously, you know, it's unfortunate he get that he didn't get that opportunity. Um, but next year, you know, you know, God willing that we get our, our preseason that he's going to get a lot of time. Um, a lot of action, so we're going to be able to see him with live bullets going. Marcus Brady, Colts offensive coordinator, joined us here on the Andy Moore Automotive Group Hotline. Um, what is kind of your main duties, main responsibilities this early in the off season right now? I know you just got promoted, but uh, what, what's kind of on your plate here uh, to start the off season? Right now, we're just trying to finalize the staff, having a couple interviews, uh, and then trying to you know figure out who's coming in um, to fill the roles that we need, um, and then also just finalizing kind of our schedule of what we're going to do with the, once the staff is set um, as far as our offseason plan of, you know, teaching some of these new guys, these coaches, the offense, um, getting them acclimated to it, to our system, and, and and really just kind of go from there, you know, find ways to get better and add maybe new wrinkles here and there. But um, we, obviously we had good production in our offense last year. So, again, we want, we want to continue that. We have a good foundation and then just kind of build from there. And then the other part of it is evaluating players. I mean, you know, we got free agency coming up. We have the draft coming up. Um, so in those times, we, you know, we're start evaluating players as well. How much of your time would you say right now is spent on evaluating the quarterback market, whether that be free agents, trade, potential guys, or, or even the uh, early look of the draft? Definitely spending some time there. Uh, obviously, that's an important position that, that we got to iron out. 
And so, yes, I'm, I'm looking at guys on, on film, and, and then we'll go from there. Do you get into the draft this early, or is it still kind of the free agency guys or, or, or trade guys? It's a little early right now. We kind of start with free agency because that hits first. Uh, I believe that's like March 17th. Um, so we'll start with those guys, and then we'll get more into the draft as our um, scouting department kind of narrows down our um, guys that we want to you know, want to focus on. You know, obviously a week from Sunday, Marcus, uh, you know, Chiefs and, and, and Bucks, and you look at those two quarterbacks, and to me they're, they're so generational, but at the same time they're vastly different styles. I guess what stands out to you about Patrick Mahomes and Tom Brady and how they have gone about playing the quarterback position? Well, they're fun to watch. Um, definitely that, you know, obviously watching Tom over the years, and he just finds a way to win. I mean, he's so poised in the pocket, makes big-time throws. Um, I mean, he does it all. So, I mean, he's just won some big-time games when everybody thought he was out of it. So, um, obviously, he's proven there. Uh, and then, uh, you know, with Mahomes coming up, um, obviously had a great past couple of years and amazing season this year. And he, his, his arm talent is unbelievable, the throws that he's able to make. Um you know, off-platform throws is ridiculous, and he's he's fun to watch. If I were giving you kind of a create-a-player video game with a quarterback, what would be kind of three or four traits that you would immediately want in that guy? Uh, arm talent, uh, being able to push the ball down the field, so arm strength, uh, accuracy, and then really being able to move around in the pocket, you know, be able to create extra time in the pocket because – Defenses are good. They got some good pass rushers. So, you know, when quarterbacks are able to buy a little bit of extra time, give the receivers a little bit more time to get open, that's where big plays are are, are made. So uh, those are probably the top three right there. Do you think the mobility trade or just even kind of subtle movements to keep plays alive, do you think that that's grown a little bit more lately here in today's NFL? Uh, No doubt. Uh, You're seeing it across the league, guys that can move around. You don't necessarily have to be um, the Lamar Jacksons of the league. Um, but you do, you're going to have to move in the pocket. Um, like I said, defenses are good. Pass rushes are, I mean, the DNs are so much faster now um, these days. And so quarterbacks need to be able to buy some time and move. And they're creating big plays. I mean, Josh Allen made a living this season of just move, buying time and making big plays on the field. Certainly, yeah, we saw that in the wild card game. Uh, just a couple more with you, Marcus, if, if you don't mind. What were uh, maybe one or two takeaways, the biggest things you learned from coaching Phillip Rivers? From coaching him, well, I learned a lot from him just through his experience, um, and with him knowing so much, you know, I, you know, as a coach, it made me better. But also, I, I learned how much you can put on a quarterback's plate, you know, when you have IQ that high. So, um, it, it, it was good, awesome working with him, and and I mean, I'm looking forward obviously to the next quarterback. But I, I enjoyed my relationship with him. Um, this season um, there's just so much that he brought to the table from a protection standpoint from game planning he helped out in game planning and just the way he thought and went about you know as a true professional um, it was awesome to, to, to witness that I think um, if I'm not mistaken your name was floated around potentially for the offense coordinator job down in Jacksonville I would assume that would have involved calling plays what was the balance for you in weighing opportunities as of you know what, whether you're in Jacksonville potentially calling plays for the number one overall pick or now you're here where there's an uncertain quarterback future and you aren't calling plays? Well, I wanted to be here. You know, the opportunity um, elsewhere, they, they didn't – you know, I didn't get that far. Once the opportunity came here, this is where I wanted to be. And so uh, I really don't have to worry about the what-if game anymore. But I, I'm glad to be here and glad to be part of the horseshoe here. Um, the family's here, so it's a great thing here. When you're not hooping and it's not COVID, uh, you got any go-to spots in the uh, in the Indy area for the Brady family? Uh, well, I would say my favorite restaurant would probably be Cheap. I'm a sushi guy, and uh, they, there's some good actually sushi sushi there. What's your uh, What's your go-to sushi spot? Uh, Chiba in Westfield. Chiba, nice, 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 nice. All right, Marcus. Well, thank you for the time. I know you're a busy man, and um, congrats again. And uh, Looking forward to a pretty busy uh, offseason for you guys. No, oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. And again, thank you to Marcus Brady right there for the time last week on the ride with JMV. And uh, personality rise, Chris, he reminds me so much of Frank. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I thought, you know, a lot of his answers, I thought he gave great detail on just what Jacob Eason's, you know, life was like. You know, I tried to give him several Jacob Eason questions, then want to spend the whole interview on that. And then I, I just thought the quarterback trait thing of the live arm, 
and the off-platform throws, arm talent is real. And it was kind of funny. Did you see the Colts signed that quarterback earlier this week? I did. Um, I, I, treated, I uh, tweeted out the... Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. <laughs> <laughs> Did you? Of the uh, of the podium, the, the yeah, yeah, yeah then the, the podium. Um, I think Prairie View A and M, I believe, is where he he attended undrafted free agent Jalen Morton. I think is his name. Um, I should probably know that off the top of my head, but um, big arm, huge arm. And his Prairie View A and M bio, they talked about how he can throw it 100 yards. <laughs> that is a huge arm. Sounds like a circus act. Yeah, but uh, in all seriousness, I I just think that that's a trait. So start looking at the draft and those live arms mm-hmm. and Eason certainly live arm um, so I, I just think that's another decision maker that yes he's not as high up as Chris or Frank but he's gonna have a say and Frank clearly respect I mean they had you know, I asked him they didn't really have any ties I mean very few ties before coming here on the staff and now he's already been promoted to be offense coordinator over Mike Grow over Jason Michael right. who you know ended up going to Philly so I think that's noteworthy as well so hope you guys enjoyed that interview with uh with Marcus Cool. Well, let's jump into Twitter questions, Kevin. All right. All right, this first one comes from AJ. If the Colts never considered giving up their first-round pick to Stafford, would this be a sign that there's a player that they have fallen in love with that they need to that they needed to keep that first-round pick for? Interesting. Um Yeah, AJ, that's that's a good point. You know, it's it's funny to me, Chris. I think come mid-March, the Colts going to have to show their hand a little bit. Mhm. Show their hand of what they think about Quentin Nelson, a left tackle. Show their hand about their wideout depth. Uh, show their hand a little bit at corner. Show their hand a little bit at edge rusher and quarterback. You know, if you would have made the move for Stafford, you aren't coming back and drafting a quarterback in round one. So, you know, AJ, I don't want to go full in on, like, they've fallen in love with somebody and they absolutely need that first round. They had some interest in Stafford. Like, I don't want to act like they just right. sat on their hands. Um but this is definitely something to just keep your eye on because in all likelihood, if you're going to make any sort of trade up, 21st overall pick has got to be on the table. Yeah. Kevin Stanley feels like the trade was a little too rich for his blood regarding Stafford. Wants to know if you would have given up that much. And he doesn't feel like uh, that fits into the philosophy for Ballard if we do trade up in the draft considering he likes to keep his picks. You know, Stanley, the, the, the Rams, again, are such an outlier. I mean, what, what is missing from their team right now? You know, Robert Woods. I, I've talked about how I think the Colts are built more of this five- to seven-year window. You mm-hmm. know, the, all those guys ages 22 to 28. The Rams are more of the win now. Again, Donald about to turn 30. Robert Woods a little bit older as well. Um, I, I just think some of their premium players are a little bit on that. Uh, they're reaching that, that dangerous age of 30. And, like, quarterback was clear to them that Mississippi. And they didn't have a first-round pick this year. Yeah. You know, that was obviously traded for Ramsey. So I think they've pretty much pushed their chips to the middle there. So uh, I guess I'm just like, if I'm the GM for the Rams, if I'm the GM for the Colts, if I'm the GM for the Jaguars, I'm probably thinking very differently about Stafford and the exact value that he would have there. You know, as far as the whole, what's he say? What are the odds they trade up in the draft to find it unlikely due to Ballard's philosophy and love of draft picks? Mm hmm. I think Ballard gets it. Like quarterback is unique, and there it's a pretty penny to go up and, and and get picks. And I guess this does come back to now you're drafting at 21. You obviously hope to be drafting later in years to come. I will reiterate this point, and I don't want this to sound like a shot at DeForest Buckner and what he means, but that is why I was one of the people that when you were at 13 overall to say you need to explore the possibility of taking a quarterback. Because you're you're in the top half of the first round. Mm-hmm. And moving from 13 to 5, where you would have been in a position to get Tua or Herbert, is a whole lot different than moving from 21 to, what are we thinking? You know, we said on last week's podcast, 6, yeah. right? Is yep. that where Philly mm-hmm. is? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's now 7 <laughs> with the Lions. Maybe you got to go higher. Maybe you got to get to 4 if, if you know, where, where, where Atlanta is. This is stuff that we'll continue to break down over the next couple of months. But – Stanley, to your point, I get it. Chris has a philosophy, but I also think he knows that quarterback's pretty darn unique. Yeah. All right, Kevin, Brett says he's speaking for the fan base here. Oh, says, gosh. please calm my nerves and tell me that the odds of Brissett being the starting quarterback in 2021 is less than 15%. <laughs> well, in Vegas, isn't he, isn't he the favorite? 
He is the favorite in Vegas, yeah. And that was before Stafford, right? Correct, yeah. So he's got he has to only only improved. Um, Brett, boy, I you know I had Mike Wells on the on the um, show last Friday, and he asked me this this very question. I told Wells I would rather um, I'd rather caddy for him barefoot every single round of golf that Mike Wells plays this summer than see Jacoby start <laughs> for a third year. Wow, that's tough. I know that's harsh, but it, it's just I've seen the act twice. I think he's a very, very fine backup, but to achieve the goals that this franchise has clearly stated and should state, yeah, considering where they are over the last two decades as a franchise and without a doubt where their roster is currently, I don't see how you run it back with them. Now, I can also sit here and acknowledge like he is the only one that has knowledge of the playbook of any substance in game action. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess Nick Foles, maybe. You want to throw another name in there, but uh, Brent, I guess to calm your nerves, Jim Irsay said a whole lot last week in 50 minutes of talking to us. I believe he talked about Ben Affleck, Tom Cruise, <laughs> the 1969 Cubs, Schindler's Law. I don't think Jacoby Brissett ever came out of his mouth. Yeah. So <laughs> I know you would think Irsay would have said something to that level. Um, it, it, it's it's funny and sad and. I, 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 it might not even be funny, so I disregard I said funny, Chris, but someone tweeted at me um, over the weekend, it cannot be overstated how badly Andrew Luck screwed this franchise. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, again, it, 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 funny probably it isn't the right word, and whatever, Luck decided he no longer wanted to make the sacrifices it takes to play the game of football. Fine. But that's a dead-on statement. I mean, Andrew Luck screwed. The Colts. They he has put him put them, did and continues to do, I guess, put them in awful <laughs> situation. And I, I just keep on thinking to myself, a lot a lot would be cured if Andrew Luck just called up Jim Mercy and said, Yeah, about that Michael Jordan facts, you know, that <laughs> Jim was talking about last Thursday. Right. I'm back, you know, and like this is the final year of team control. That was the reason why I asked Ursay that question about luck last week. But man, it's just and you retire, you know, two weeks before the start of the season, so you missed out free agency and draft in 2019. Mm-hmm. Well, was it 2019? All the years running together. I think it was 2019. Um, to, you know, potentially address it then. Or at least know that your roster building now it comes with not having Andrew Luck. But, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It, it, it can't be Jacoby. I, <laughs> I don't know, man. 15% is probably a bit low, to be honest with you. But if you're going to take Ursa at what it's worth, yeah. then then it's a no. But if you're going off straight Vegas odds and, like, you look at this from a gambling standpoint, it would be higher than 15 It's just I don't want to sound like I'm, you know, Joe Biden, Donald Trump, Barack Obama, or some, like, you know, president of the United States or get on my high horse with, like, this, this like, slogan statement. But – to me, it keeps on coming to the forefront of my mind, Chris, of if you want to be great, and I say this as like an NFL roster builder, if you want to be great, you have to be bold. Mm-hmm. And like that is the slogan. Now, again, bold and stupidity are not the same thing. But let's look at, let's just look at the final four teams. Kansas City trades up 20 spots. Right. To take a guy from an air raid offense. Buffalo trades up twice. They trade up two different times to get Josh Allen. From 21 to 12 and from 12 to 7. To draft a dude from Wyoming. That was like a 50% passer his final year. Mm-hmm. Now you go go to the NFC. Green Bay drafts a quarterback. When they had Brett Favre seemingly in the final stages of, of the prime years. I mean, that was before teams started doing that. Yes, yeah. like, That was crazy when they took Rodgers. And then, obviously, Tampa Bay says, all right, Tom, in Bruce Arians' offense, we we feel like you still have enough Mm -hmm. to get us to where we need to go. Those are bold, bold moves. And, Brett, I guess to your question, it would be bold, certainly, to start Jacoby for a third year. But what I'm getting at here is the draft and making a substantial move because I just think that's where you're at right now. And – your position to be pretty good. To get to great, got to be bold. This one comes from Walker based on how— Do you think I, I could run for office or no? Yeah. No chance. Yeah, you can run for office. Why not? Gosh, I'd probably have some— 
Would you want to? No, that's the, that's no, the, the big no, question. Man. Yeah. No way. Too much. You'd be Mike why, Wells. You could be like Wells. Why would anyone, not to get off, but why would anyone want to be the president of the United States? Like, well, why would anyone, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, Brownsburg School Board, good for you. And I love it because, you know, I've come from a family of educators, but. Yeah, yeah, I think we're good on Kevin's corner. Yeah, not for me. I'm no. I'm I'm good where I am. Mm-hmm. I'll vote. I'll vote. I'll just yeah. I'll vote. I won't run. <laughs> this one's from Walker. Based on how outstanding Eason's arm talent is, from literally everyone who's talked about it, and the hesitancy for people to draft him, such management to turn to him, does that tell us that his mental processing and other football skills are that bad? Thanks, Kevin. Hope you're doing well. Love listening to the podcast. Well, thank you, Walker. Same to you and everyone out there. Um. Well, I mean, that sounds like the dude like can't literally process and 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 I don't know walk and shoot gum at the line of scrimmage, and I don't want to go to that extent. But again, Walker, mental processing was an issue. Mm. Uh, you know, Marcus Brady, we heard him earlier, talked about the fo- footwork accuracy element that needs to match up as well with him, especially I think when the pocket gets a little bit chaotic. So, I think the biggest thing with Eason is. There was a lot for him to lo- learn, be a sponge, absorb in his first year of the NFL mentally. Now it's translating that into the f- physical aspect of playing the game of football. So, yes, when you're talking about the Eason puzzle, a big arm matters. But, I mean, shit, J- Jamarcus Russell had a big arm. Like, hey, right. <laughs> there's a lot more to play to quarterback. Is it a key ingredient? Do I find it attractive because it's unteachable? Without a doubt. But at the same time, there's multiple layers to it. So, yes, the 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 hesitancy from management, people to draft them, I, I think a lot of it comes back to, again, those lack of game reps. If he could have gone back to Washington, he, and he could have, and played, he might be in that conversation right mm-hmm. now for a top 10, top 15 pick. But he didn't. So now who's going to be patient as a franchise to expose him to those reps and believe that the growing pains either you'll live with them or they won't be that long and you can get him to the level of where he was once thought of as five-star, true freshman starter in the SEC. And, you know, before the start of his last year at Washington, people thought a first-round pick. Right. And, Kevin, I think he's the – I'm i going to state it right now. He's going to be the, the quarterback of, of the Colts. Here? Yep. 2021? Possibly. What makes you say that? Like you said, all the intangibles that he had and all of the, the rankings that he had and that big arm, why not just go with it? Just, as you mentioned, what, what makes the difference between him being a fourth-round pick and a top-15 pick is the reps. He's coming back early to work with the quarterback coach here, correct? Uh, yeah, well, he's going to do some Tom House stuff in California. Or in California. Then, yeah, and then you know, hopefully OTAs will be normal. Now, those aren't game reps. That those are right. That's right. that's huge. That's key. I am to the point where I am willing as a fan and a viewer of the game to take the lumps of one to two years in hopes that he pans out. That's interesting. I think it's a great point you make there at the end, Chris, because I think judging at least by people that I interact with on social media, I feel like that's the minority view of people willing to live with growing pains or lumps or whatever that entails. I, I'm content. Now, again, you know, I'm, I'm pretty objective here, but I'd be pretty content, I think, if this is Notre Dame and, you know, Tyler Buckner, they've got this hot five-star freshman. It's mm-hmm. like, okay, you know, let's baptism by fire him and then let's see what he can do for the next two years of eligibility and maybe a third year after that. So um, I, I agree with you in that willingness to um, live with that. I think what is concerning and devil's advocate there is, is he definitely a guy that 13, 14, 15 games will cure it and mm-hmm. then you and then you're good. right. You know the, I think that is a concern. Obviously he was a fourth round pick. So I think that is your real concern of, okay, what if I drafted a guy in the first round that I feel like is more of an insurance, assurance, like I I really believe in him, and that guy I can throw into the fire, and then all of a sudden I feel better about him than maybe I do Eason. And while I agree with a lot of what you said, I just don't see the Colts ever doing that. I just wish they would. I I don't want to continue this. Is that tanking or no? One to two year. I don't want to tank. That's, I mean... 
uh, you kind of go back and forth on it because you can be like the Pacers here in Indy where every year they're a, a four to six seed and then you know they're drafting 18 to 22nd and if you don't hit on that 18 to 22nd pick you're constantly in limbo right so right. I, I don't know I, th- I feel like if the Colts had a little higher of a pick I could see them jumping I just don't know what it's going to take to jump up to get yeah. that quarterback. And that's that's such such the mystery that we have here. Um, yeah, it's. I'm glad you made that point. I mean, I, I think there are some people out there that that do feel like that about Eason, but again, internally inside that building, I can't see them doing that mm-hmm. here in Week One in 2021. It, it would be interesting to me of. You know, you go out and you get a, and, and right now, and this is something we can get into a little bit later, but. If you're gonna list list me, and we'll get back to Twitter questions, but we've we're we're on a different path here. If you're gonna list me again, the free agent options, the trade options, I put this in a story. I want to subvide the fan To me, the guy that I would be most okay with, and I say okay because that's just kind of where I'm at right now. Yeah, is probably Derek Carr. Now again. I mean, the Raiders haven't seriously, like, floated him around. I think just because they're the Raiders, we always think that That's they true. could do something crazy. But, like, right. that would be, again, of the realistic candidates. It probably, in some order, is like a Carr, Wentz, Darnold. I like Wentz better than Darnold as a player and think Reich could resurrect that better than he could Darnold. But financially, I like Darnold better than, For, than, yeah. than Wentz, you know, from a cap situation standpoint. But again, none of those. If we're going to go to the one to ten excitement factor, yeah, I guess Carr a little bit. But you know, again, we we we've never even heard his name really exactly on the market. And where are the Raiders going to go with that pick? With them not having that top ten mm-hmm. sort of, sort of selection. So, yeah, the Eason thing is um, it's it's fascinating, and, and I'm glad that um, he'll be joining us next week on the uh, on the pod. Well, Yuri's going to keep it there with a, another name that you did not mention in regards to quarterbacks. Is it a vi- is it viable to consider a trade for Jordan Love if the Colts can't climb in the draft? Is it viable to consider a trade for Jordan Love? Um, doesn't sound like the Packers are moving on, based off what you know. I saw some. I think they asked him specifically about Love. Um, so yeah, I don't blame them at all with the Rodgers volatility. You know, it, it, if they were. You know, to to keep him. Right. Um, so, yeah, it doesn't sound like the Packers are moving on. This question comes from Germany, Kevin. Okay. I'm going to probably botch the name, so bear with me. Ufuk? That's, okay. That's what, that's what I'm going yeah, with. Sounds good to me. Saw on Twitter that J.J. Watt was the seventh best edge rusher last year, graded by Pro Football Focus. If the Texans would release him, do you think the Colts should consider to pursue him? Kind of like Justin with the Justin Houston deal but I believe Watt would be a bit more expensive. Thanks for answering all the questions and keep up the good work. Well, yeah, thank you for listening from uh, from Germany. That's uh, that's awesome to hear that. Uh, I think we have a decently strong listenership over over in Europe. Yeah, I, I would say an upgrade over Houston. I don't love it. Again, just a little bit old, and, and you know, he's really had some big-time injuries mm-hmm. as well. So, you know, I think Watt can give a, a team on the cusp a really good season or two, but I think there's some risk factors that you that you would have in play there. So I'll go back to kind of the two names I mentioned earlier. And Carl Lawson and uh, Romeo Okora. Joe wants to know, with T.Y. being the last player banner on the side of Lucas Oil, Oil and us possibly not re-signing him, who do we replace the posters with and who are all four of the banners? Ooh, I always like this debate. So T.Y.'s it? Mm-hmm. Vinatieri, they still have thanks for the memories. Or did they, did I they don't they know if they do down? or not. That was the one on the I seventy side. Oh, yeah. Ty was on the I seventy side. Ty well. was yeah. or is on the I seventy side, I should say. Um, okay, you got four of them. Well, I I just think it makes sense, and especially that your defense played this year, two offense and two two D. So Nelson and Leonard are no brainers to me. Um, I think you put DeForest Buckner over Kenny Moore. I know some people might disagree with that, but if the dude's an all pro. I, I know Kenny's a little bit more of a homegrown talent, and, mm-hmm. and trust me, I mean, you guys know what I think of Kenny Moore, but so I'll go there. So I have one offensive player. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Yeah, you just you put up Justin Fields in Ohio State uniform, and then you <laughs> migrate. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he play, he's played in your building. Before. That's true. Um, Taylor? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I don't know. Jack Doyle? I, I Yeah. The Colts, I feel like, would be afraid to, like, put up a young player like that. They'd probably put up Doyle. I think it's a little safer, but mm-hmm. I don't know. Nelson, Taylor, Buckner, Leonard. This one comes from John. You, like? you, you, you got any? Uh, for me, it's hard because, yes, Nelson deserves to be up there. It's not really fun to look at, like, a lineman. <laughs> no. I don't feel like. But, but he's got to be up there. You have to put him up yeah. there. When you when you're, what, three all pros in your first three years, like, you just have to. Um, we saw Ursay's quote about him. It was, jeez. You're getting to the point where maybe you Rigoberto Sanchez. I know punters aren't yeah, always boy, fan favorites yeah. either, but. In this town, Man, he can play. Yeah. I'll go 2 0, 2 D. Sounds good. This one comes from John. Will, lose, will losing Rathman due to retirement hurt the running backs, or will the Colts continue that mentality of keeping the football off the ground? And he mentions Jonathan Taylor in regards to that. Yeah, Tom Rathman hanging it up, retiring. Honestly, Chris, this might sound harsh. I think he might be a bigger loss than Nick Sirianni, which. You know, a lot of people disagree with. Hopefully, Eagles fans aren't listening and, and hearing that. But I just think at running back, you know, you're always dealing with young guys. Yeah. It's such a position that churns. I feel like coaching at that position matters a whole lot. Um, boy, a lot of assistance <laughs> that the staff has to replace. Right. But I guess that's just kind of part of it, especially when you you get a, a coordinator that gets hired somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, I, I would like to think that Rathman has instilled that in the Naeem Hines and those guys, and you really, you know, Jonathan Taylor, you know, was great at it this season. I mean, what, the guys have fumbled like twice? and Yeah. It's an absurd amount. 1,600 is the number that's popping into my head right now. Touches and whatnot, so. Um, it's a loss, but I also feel like he's kind of ingrained a little bit of that. Yeah, there'll be some turnover where maybe it's not as consistent, but. Mm-hmm. You'd like to think Frank Reich will make that very clear during the interview <laughs> process with any running back candidates. This next one comes from Josh. On the topic of Deshaun Watson requesting a trade from the Texans, does this no-trade clause heighten the chance of a bargain bin Ballard being able to make a trade for him? <laughs> I know from the battles in the AFC South, Deshaun has good relationships with the Colts like Darius Leonard. If other teams make offers that are higher that the Texans would rather entertain, Watson still has to, ad- to agree to the destination so by that system, if Watson did take to the liking of the Colts, there would be a real, realistic chance that the Texans would have no choice but to take Ballard's offer. Whether that's at the top of the market trade value offered or not, what are your thoughts about this? Proud to say you guys are the only ones that I turn to for my weekly Colts fix and keep up the great work. Wow, that means a ton, Josh. Yeah. Thank you. I know that people's time is precious, so... For us to churn out whatever we're doing, hour plus now in the off season, that uh, that, that that really means a lot. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, I mean the whole no trade clause is the issue here with with Watson, and it seems like some other teams have been leaked as interest more so than um, than the Colts. And I will reiterate what I've said before: I will not believe that Watson's been traded until I see it. Mm-hmm. I just I I feel like this will get mended. I don't. It doesn't look. Great, and certainly Ian Rapport and Adam Schefter um, have the ear of the agent because uh, every tweet you see, it is all about Deshaun Watson's people reaching out to them, whereas guys like John McClain and more of the Houston people are a little bit more plugged in to internally right. where Houston's coming at, coming at it from their side of things. So I, I just don't see Watson staying on the table demanding, I'm going to Indianapolis or nowhere else. Yeah. I don't, as much as that sounds like a great dream, and he would immediately go on the side of the building and probably on the side of Salesforce Tower, <laughs> that uh, I don't see that happening. Yeah, I was shocked that he reportedly wanted to go to the Jets. I'm like, dude, why? Yeah, that's like, you want to be in that market? Right, yeah. tougher market and still a shitty team? Like, yeah, no I thanks. I know. I'm like, Deshaun, I thought you were kind of a bright guy. <laughs> this is from John. The Colts' quarterback possibilities can give a person anxiety. <laughs> But I'm more concerned about what in-house free agents do you think we get to re-sign, and who are the few players that you want to bring back? Nice, John. Okay, uh, this is a different question, and I like it. Um, I will again tease the article up on the site, kind of mm-hmm. the tiers of free agents. But I think Alkadi Muhammad makes a lot of sense. I have Xavier Rhodes and Danico Autry in that upper tier as well, Chris. 
But in terms of the Colts, like who do they re-sign? I would say al Muhammad. Muhammad. I like T.J. Carey, especially with the Rhodes indecision there. And I, I think Danico Autry. Those are probably some names that I'd start with there. Now you can debate on the Justin Houstons, the T.Y. Hiltons, the Marlon Max. You know, who knows about LaRaven Clark and you know some mm-hmm. guys a little bit down the list, Anthony Walker as well. But I think al Muhammad's Muhammad is the most definite and I'd probably put Autry and Carey a little bit of my mind, a little bit of the Colts' mind kind of next up. Drew wants to know your thoughts about the Colts potentially targeting someone like Marshawn Lattimore. Says he knows that he might be a little bit too expensive, but with this being his last year and on his contract, the Saints might want him off yeah. their books. Again, I just don't think corner means that much. Outside corner means that much to the Colts. You know, it's I know they've drafted relatively high there, but the trade and the contract and all that, other teams, I think, will have the value of Marshawn Lattimore higher than the Colts. Mm-hmm. This question comes from the Joker. Says, "I know the off season, all of the, the talk, Joker, all the talk will be on the offensive side, but could the Colts benefit defensively from a little philosophy change? Just thinking about our defensive backs, and they don't create many individual turnovers against good teams compared to other playoff caliber teams." Yeah, I'm. Um, it's it's a good point that the Joker brings up here. You know, the turnovers really kind of tapered off late, um, late in the year. Mm-hmm. It was interesting. I think their turnover numbers are actually about dead even with their first two years under Eberflus, which I feel like if you just walked up to the you know casual fan on the street, they probably would have thought you know the turnovers this year were higher than they were the previous two years. Um, yeah, I I, I would I, I would like to see a little bit of a philosophy change um again you know last week i tried to make the car analogy and i think it was terrible based off what (laughs) someone mentioned to me so i guess i'll go with the um the old chef in the kitchen i I want as many ingredients as many different dishes as possible you don't have to use every single ingredient Mm -hmm. or every single dish but over the course of a 16 game season with the variety of teams that you see in the nfl especially like in the afc like tennessee Baltimore and Kansas City, vastly different. Vastly different right. how they operate. I, I want to have as many things that I feel like I can go to. But I'm not holding my breath on that. The Joker. All right, Isaac wants to know, would it make sense for the Colts to trade for Tua? Says with left tackle being a big need, having a lefty quarterback could take some pressure off of that position a bit. Yeah, I don't hate Tua. I don't. Um, but, I, Isaac, I'm not like... I think this is kind of an old NFL philosophy. If you have a righty, you have to have a great left tackle. If you have a lefty, you have to have a great right tackle. I think I'd have two pretty good tackles in today's NFL. We've talked about the Watt brothers, right. you know, rushing opposite the right tackle. So I don't think I look at it and say, go get Tua because that means you don't need to invest heavily at left tackle. No, I, I don't. That's no, I don't. I don't go there. All right, let's go down to a question from Sam says, hey, KB, I'm curious what you think about the Colts potentially trading for Jalen Hurts if the Eagles decide to go back to Wentz? Mm. Do you think he did enough to prove that he's a legit starter in the league? No. No. I, the, and I'll tell you what, the Eagles would really be back in Carson Wentz if they just bailed on Hurts after right. one year. If I'm Nick Sirianni, I might say, hey, let's have both of them for, for a year. Yeah, I don't – Hurts is, is, is fine, but I don't – I don't look at him and say, trade for him. He's a future. Put him mm-hmm. on the side of the building. Patrick asks, with the retirement of Costanzo and potential for Rivers to call it quits, which we know that he did, is this the most consequential season for Ballard, and what does success or failure look like, and how does it affect his future? Boy, Patrick, it's such a complicated you know, way to answer that. Yes, it's it's consequential, but I would argue last year was consequential. I mean, you had the 13th overall pick. You made a drastic move for DeForest Buckner. You gave Phillip Rivers $25 million. It's uh, it, it's Chris, it's kind of hard to say, like, if the Colts would have traded the 13th overall pick for the 5th overall pick and, mm-hmm. you know, some other picks there, that would have been really consequential last year. It just would have looked differently. So I think when you don't have the answer at quarterback, every – offseason can be extremely consequential Um, what looks like success you hate to boil it down to one spot but if you find the future at quarterback and I don't care what else you do it's an unquestioned success especially with the resources you have Mm -hmm. I mean you're drafting 21 there that's no slam dunk by any means you aren't Jacksonville or 
the Jets or whatever. Right. Um, and part of me thinks it's left incomplete if you don't find that. Someone asked me to grade. I don't know if it's a question in this week's pod. But someone asked me to grade. Uh, yeah, it's it's coming up here. I'll, I'll hold off on it. Um, now, I also think finding the future at left tackle, finding the future at edge, finding the future at corner, those can all be great positive steps. But, you know, it's kind of like the quarterback answer is, you know, 50% of the test mm-hmm. or something like that. Yeah. Five more questions here for the podcast. This one's from Drew. With the offseason in bloom, there's a crazy realistic option that I, like I thought that. of. <laughs> I like that right there. With the offseason in bloom, I'm, I might need to use that in a story. It's a great start. That uh, I would that would be channeling my Patrick Reed just shooting <laughs> right off Drew there. Oh, that. boy. Says, in no way do I advocate this, nor do I want this to happen, but Ballard traded a first-round pick for a blue-chip player in Buckner. Could you see him trade a blue-chip player for a first-round pick? Leonard and Nelson come to mind. Mm-hmm. If he sent one of them to, let's say, Miami or Cincinnati – who are in need of O-line help or defensive playmaking and could land an easy top five potential franchise quarterback? Ridiculous question, I know. Just wanted your thoughts on that type of scenario. Drew, uh, you might call it ridiculous. I say I love it. I love the question. but I don't know if I love doing it, but I love the question. I um, Interesting. Mm-hmm. Really makes your mind think. You know, yeah. you don't see a lot of this, obviously. Um, you certainly don't see a lot of it, I think, from teams that are in the position the Colts feel like they're in, you know, so close to that mountaintop. Boy, um, yeah, getting them, what, Miami's number three, Cincinnati's number five, I think, in the draft. Man, that's uh, – I mean, Nelson straight up, I think I, – I don't I don't know if that would be enough. That's crazy that sounds. Yeah. yeah. Like, Nelson straight up for the third overall pick, they're – Again, how do the Dolphins view guard? You know, I, 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 I've i talked about it before. You know, Ryan Gregson was very adamant about, I've been on championship teams that don't invest in the interior of their offensive line significantly. That's how my roster building is going to go. Chris Ballard realized very quickly, <laughs> we need to invest in the interior. And obviously, Gregson did eventually with the Ryan Kelly draft selection and whatnot. But, boy, that's... Uh, I think, like, part of NFL films, Chris, part of, like, 30 for 30s, all this, I'd love to hear, like, all the trades that are discussed that right. never got to the finish uh-huh. line. Just throwing out trade packages, you know. Like, what would that look like? Yeah. Okay, you know. In all seriousness, what would Patrick Mahomes on the trade market look like? Just, it's outrageous. <laughs> it's ludicrous. It's a waste of time. And I'm a loser, and I want to hear those conversations. <laughs> and I, I don't, I mean, Drew, I... I I can't see the Colts doing it. I, I I don't know. Maybe Leonard, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, Kariki, here you go. But, you know, Leonard means right. so much to you from a leadership standpoint. and He's such a unique linebacker, mm-hmm. too, in his ability to get the football and take it away. So Yeah, did you see him in the Pro Bowl this weekend? <laughs> so what what was that? I, I kind of was following along there. Was he just on his farm and just yeah, acting like he, he just, was playing? just put his, put his uh, old Pro Bowl uniform on and just was out there having fun with his buddies. He's one of a kind. Yes, he is. He is uh, one of a kind. I for, I think, I don't know, what was it? Mathis re- retweeted me about the Prairie View A&M quarterback. I was like, okay, Leonard's one that usually calls me out on Twitter. Mathis is the other one. So I was like, I saw the Mathis retweet. I'm like, oh, okay, good. Well, <laughs> you know, I'll screenshot that. And the next time he comes after me, I'll be like, you liked me then. Yeah, come on now. This one's from Trevor with the regular season over now. And this is one you were mm-hmm. teasing up here just a couple minutes ago. What is Ballard's 2020 draft grade so far? Man, Chris, it's a um, boy. It's a it's a A minus B plus. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's really good. Yeah. Um, now again, I'll say it's incomplete because you have the Eason carrot in there, which like Eason can go so many different ways. You know, in, in your world, it, you would love for it to obviously everyone would love for it to be an A and, and work out. But I mean, let's be honest. Just and this is what happens when you draft quarterbacks. It can bottom out, like. It could. Yeah. You, what If you trade up for a quarterback this year and all of a sudden you say, oh, we need to go sign Tyrod Taylor. We need to go sign a veteran to mentor that guy. Now Eason is back in the same position he was in last year. And who knows if he ever gets out of that position. Colts might keep on saying, hey, rather have a veteran. Rather have a veteran. Nope, nope, nope. So that's where it's a little bit incomplete. I guess Danny Pinter a little bit incomplete as well. And that's part of that, again, is O-line. So I, honestly, the only if I were just going off straight picks, Chris, it's probably like an A minus, 
just based off those first three guys and what you got out of them. I might channel it down to a B plus just because I felt like offensive tackles should have been in the works at some point. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're grading again, just straight like the guys they drafted, you know, and I guess you're a little incomplete on those six rounders as well. But man, those first three guys, I mean, they did a whole lot for you. This next question comes from Scott. He says, "Hi, Kevin. Saw your article about Hilton and other free agents." Uh, besides Rivers, who do you think is a lock to be re-signed in the offseason? Yeah, obviously Rivers. <laughs> we got this well before Phil situation. Um, this kind of goes with what I said earlier. I think al Muhammad Muhammad might be the only person I would consider a lock. Yeah. Like, again, I mean, who knows there? If they all of a sudden they feel like they're falling in love with an edge rush, I just think al Muhammad Muhammad helps you out on every down. So, yeah, he'd be my lock. All right, two more here. This one comes from Jordy. So there was an article by Jeremy Fowler on uh, on ESPN where he says the NFL executives believe the Colts would snag Stafford or Wentz in the offseason. The article quotes anonymous executives saying there is a reason the Colts only signed Rivers to a one-year deal. So do you think there's truth to this article or is it just hearsay? Also, if you had to pick between Wentz and Stafford, which one would you have gone with? Oh, definitely Stafford. Yeah. Um yeah, Chris, you know, it kind of goes back to your earlier point there about are people scared with a rookie QB? Like, if you go 6-10, and 10, you go 7-9 and nine for a year. <laughs> yeah, it sucks losing. But, mm-hmm. like, to me that's not DEFCON when you can see some light at the end of the tunnel. Right. Like, I, I don't know. Was this your fun for the Chargers? Was it fun for Chargers fans? I I don't know. <laughs> Maybe not early on. Maybe all the late game losses was heartbreaking and all yeah. that. But, like, and maybe you're not getting Herbert. Maybe you're getting a step below Herbert. But, I mean, if you plug in a step below Herbert onto this roster, I think you backdoor your way maybe into the playoffs. Maybe. Right. Um, you probably aren't winning 11, but I don't know. In a normal year, does 8-8 eight and eight get you in, 9-7? and seven? It would have got, you know, Pittsburgh in two years ago. So, um. Do you think there's truth to this article? Or is it hearsay? I mean, everything's a bit of hearsay, and you got to sift through smoke screens right now. And it's why I tried to make it very clear last week in the whole, you know, I've, again, I've I've heard that the Colts pushed Rivers out. Um, I've also heard that Rivers retired on his own. Like you, you hear both, and it's very hard to confirm anything, right? Especially at quarterback, especially at quarterback and I know how much Chris Bauer wants that building tight lip like none other so that's just the difficult nature that you run into right now and it's a big reason why I I never wrote it and just try to make it very clear that this is speculation with a little bit of education behind it so um yeah uh, I go with Stafford I guess if he's asking again between Wentz and Stafford all right, our last question comes from Josh. So he's yeah. been, been watching the podcast for a while now, and he's always admired your ability to show how much you love your family but still stay on the topic at hand. How does it feel to cover your favorite team and have an amazing family? Wow. Thanks, Josh. Um, Jeez. This is my own Patrick Reed's burner account maybe <laughs> that you know I've got here. Josh, I don't think I have any family members named Josh. Um yeah, I, I'm very fortunate. My wife is beyond supportive, um, beyond supportive because it's crazy hours, and she was definitely not a fan of, oh, yeah, Matthew Stafford just got traded. I need to kind of focus here for a few minutes on a Saturday night while we're, you know, watching a movie. So, um, you know, I, I don't take it a day for granted. I don't know if I've told the story before, but, you know, when I was young. I woke, woke up every morning and went downstairs and read the Indy Star. I mean, we're talking elementary age, read the sports page. You know, that's what I've wanted to do since I was a young, young kid. I've learned how to do the math based off, like, Reggie Miller's box scores, like add up the points <laughs> and the field yeah. goals. And, again, just very nerd stuff. But uh, fortunate to have known, again, from a young age that what I'm passionate about and can I turn that into a profession. And knock on wood, I'm going to keep on doing it as long as I can make it possible financially and that people want me. So, yeah, Josh, the wild hours and the finances are not great. <laughs> I will, and I'll, I make that very clear to uh, the, the class at IU that I teach and, and, and when I do talk to um, you know anyone that wants to get in the industry. But Maddie Bone is beyond, beyond supportive. And uh, she loves the fact that I love doing what I love, which, yeah. again, I know it's a lot of loves thrown in there. But I think in today's day and age, 
unfortunately there's a lot of people that don't do what they love and finding it is difficult and there are cons to it I don't want to act like it's a perfect job by any means but I walk in the studio super excited every week to record the podcast. It's probably my favorite part of the week, to be honest with you, and I'm glad that uh, you guys consume it as frequently as you do, and and we've got great people, and Chris is so passionate about it. I, Chris texts me every week about numbers and everything, and it, it's awesome to see your passion and work ethic with it and makes me excited. So, yeah, Josh, thank you for the question. Very well get, said. It's already get a little sappy there to end it. But. No, that's a great way to end a podcast, you know. Um. Speaking of sappy, <laughs> okay. Peyton, first ballot this weekend? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love Mike Chappell's pitch to yeah. the committee. Got up and said he was going <laughs> to drop his laptop or right. drop the mic. So I can't drop the mic, and I'm not going to drop my laptop, but that's pretty much enough said. Yeah, so. I think Chapp actually bought that laptop from my dad at the Apple store, so my dad would have been like, come on in. <laughs> you know Apple. We, we, we'd we love to sell you another one. Um, Peyton, going in. We'll see about Reggie Wayne. Mm-hmm. That'll be a little up in the air. So Saturday night, I believe that's announced Hall of Fame every uh, every year before the Super Bowl. And again, 2021 class gets enshrined to 2020 right. because of the pandemic. And Edrin, obviously going in, that will be a party. I don't know if there's enough Canton. How long is that ceremony going to be? Whew. Yeah, I know. I, they got to do it two nights. I think Friday, Saturday, yeah. you know, 2020 class, 2021, whatever. So, um, yeah, stay tuned for that. Obviously, this weekend, the Peyton thing will be official, and then we'll see about Reggie as well. Chris Presley, your Super Bowl pick. Chiefs, Bucks. I believe the spread is three, last I saw. Three on the on, on the nose. Yes. Before I get into my pick, quickly want to add, we are doing a promotion with the Hall of Fame. So if Ooh. you are in the Indianapolis area or want to go to 1075thefan.com, it's not up yet, but here in a couple of weeks we will tease a trip to Canton to enjoy the festivities over there. Ooh, I love that. Yeah. So it should be fun. Yeah. We'll see if the Colts are playing. Right. Yeah. In that game or how that works out. Um, um you yeah. said the spread's three. Do you want to be on the spot? Go ahead. Yeah, I'll go ahead and take it. I'll I'm gonna go Chiefs. Haven't thought of the score yet. Um I'll take Chiefs and the points. Okay. For sure. Yeah. Um, uh, I think I'm leaning there too. And then I'll probably play put down a prop bet of Mahomes winning the MVP. I love the prop bets. Dude. On the Super Bowl. Dude. Heads and tails, national anthem, color of the Gatorade, yeah. all that stuff. So love. I've got my phone uh don't tell Matty Bowen this, but last night I couldn't sleep, so I just screenshotted a bunch of prop bets <laughs> late at night. and <laughs> So I've got a lot, and I'll throw a few out here. Um, Chiefs to win by 7 to 12 points, plus 550. Wow. Kind of nitpicky, yeah. but um, Chiefs minus 3.5 plus the over of 56.5. You're cheering for points, yep. and you're cheering against Brady when it's all said and done. Um, both teams score a TD on their opening drive, plus 600. Ooh. Tough, but, I mean... It, it easily you, could happen. You know aggression is the name of the game with both yep. of these coaches. Um, this one I I, uh, I thought was interesting. Tyreek Hill and Mike Evans to combine for 200 yards receiving and combine for two touchdowns. Like it. What's the, What are those odds? Plus 420. Okay. Mahomes and Brady each to have a... a one passing TD uh, in each half, plus 220. It's a little lower there, but, mm. I mean, got to think. I mean, yeah. I don't know. Boys, they, they sound so good on Tuesday at noon. and Come find me at Sunday at 10 p.m. Uh, Mike Evans to score the first TD and Tyree Kill to score the second TD, plus 6,500. Yeah, that one's by far the toughest one. That's tough, but you know what? I mean, Mike Evans scores. Just flat out. Just, of course, TDs. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Eh, eh, eh. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Okay. Um, I like the Chiefs, though. Are you, like, just so against Brady? Are you one of those people? Like we said on the last podcast, I respect the hell out of him now. Yeah. Which took me a long time to get there. But when you go to 10 Super Bowls, I mean, yeah. at some point you got to stop. You got to take the blinders off and just recognize – what you're what you're seeing i think a lot of times uh that's a mature comment by you i know but th- there's a lot of times where you look back and you realize like i think lebron james is a huge crybaby but when i look at his numbers and body of work it's like am i ever going to see an athlete like yeah. this again you never know so i'm going to enjoy the entertainment value that they give me but i hope he loses <laughs> lebron is absolutely incredible absolutely incredible and that's for another podcast but 
I, I found it interesting. Have you seen the Romo comments? Yeah. Not no. For this week, so they're they're doing the game, um, and just typical Romo. He had a conference call earlier this week and is like super into how Mahomes is feeling, should feel an abs- a, a large amount of pressure on this game because this is like Tiger versus Jack, LeBron versus MJ. Tiger never got Jack in his prime. LeBron never got MJ in his prime on this stage. Right. Mahomes got he's got Brady. And, and okay, it might not be Brady's prime, but he's got Brady in the Super Bowl. And he basically is saying it will be borderline impossible for Mahomes to be known as the greatest quarterback slash winner of all time unless he wins this game. Huh. And I think it's a great point. Yeah. Of first off, Brady's made it to ten Super Bowls. And he's won six. And, and like we talked about in last week's podcast, if your buddy bet you right now over under seven and a half, that would be a debate. You know, like it, oh, Mahomes might not even make it to all those Super Bowls. But if he loses this one, for him to be known as the greatest of all time, he's going to have to win like eight and get to like <laughs> 12. You know, and you hate to get into this legacy debate and all that. But it's, it was very interesting. By Romo. I'm like, dude, you don't need to convince me. I'm going to watch the game no matter what you say. Right. But now you've convinced me even more of like, hmm, yeah. What, what, how is Patrick going to sleep on Saturday night and, and things like that? And obviously for Brady, it's just you know more of just kind of proving it on his own. You know, There's a lot at stake for him as well. But ah, I can't wait, man. Yeah, can't it's going to be fun. Um, I think I'm going to take Tuesday off or yeah. Monday, Monday off next week. Yeah, I was going to say, take Monday. We'll come back on Tuesday for the for the podcast. Uh, thank you to Marcus Brady for hopping on. Thank you, Chris Presley. And I uh, appreciate everyone listening to this edition of Kevin's Corner. Have a great week. Enjoy Super Bowl Sunday. And uh, Jacob Beeson next week on the podcast. See you.